Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12, and you'll also receive a complimentary six months of digital access to The Telegraph for free. Hello and welcome to The Spectator's Book Club podcast. I'm Sam Lee, the literary editor of The Spectator, and my guest this week is Kate Summerscale, a former colleague and a brilliant historical non-fiction writer whose newest book is The Haunting of Alma Fielding, a true ghost story, which is about a sort of instance of poltergeist activity, haunting, ghostly manifestation, and possible demonic possession taking place in 1930s Croydon. Um, Kate, welcome. Tell us, first of all, why you gave it that subtitle, A True Ghost Story? Because most people today would think, well, it can't be. (laughs) Well, I enjoyed the sort of questions that the subtitle raised about truth and ghosts and it most ghost stories most published ghost stories are fictional in form and genre but actually in the 1930s I discovered while researching this story there was a great vogue for true ghost stories anthologies of true ghost stories were published and um, there was a fascination with the connection between ghosts and science spiritualism And so the idea of truth and ghosts was not as contradictory as it might seem now. No, I was going to say, I was thinking the book's contemporary readers or the people reading this contemporary story would would read that subtitle differently, wouldn't they? Yes. So I was sort of playing with that, with the sort of period resonance of it, which I, I hoped would emerge for the reader while reading the book, but also to draw attention to the fact that... Um, this is a non-fiction book. It's, <laughs> and to say a ghost story would be misleading in that it would imply that it was a novel. And so this was, um, it was a true one because it's, it's a researched ghost story which, is, which took place in a particular time and, and place. The thing that kind of often surprised me, how you stumble on your stories. I mean, do you sit and sort of read these yellowing newspapers through until you see something and think, that's it. I mean, what point do you know you've got another book? Well, it's different every time. Um, In this case, I had a feeling I'd like to write about the supernatural and about a haunting. And I started by reading late Victorian newspapers and, and books that I thought might give me clues as to what would be a good story to pursue. The period I found most surprising was the 30s because there was this huge flourishing of interest in in ghosts and hauntings and a great plethora of hauntings throughout Britain. Um, And this took me aback. And so the feeling of surprise and mystery um, and my own curiosity about what was really going on here was the thing that gave me the sort of energy or momentum to think this might be worth pursuing and that if I pushed at it, I would I would find something out about the time as well as the subject matter. Well, let's start start with subject matter itself. I'll be sort of delicate to try and avoid spoilers too much because, well, I'll, I'll maybe let you guide how much you say of the story. But can you sort of tell us who was Alma Fielding and how did her story start in this sense? Uh, she was an ordinary, um, apparently ordinary, working class housewife in Croydon who was married with a teenage son and a lodger in her terrace house. And she rang the newspapers one day in February 1938 to report a poltergeist in her house, who everyone else in the house testified to having seen in action also, throwing things across the room, smashing glasses and crockery. And by the time Nandor Fodor, this ghost hunter from the International Institute for Psychical Research turned up. There was an astonishing array of broken, damaged, bent objects. The house had been sort of beaten up, in effect. The newspaper men apparently saw this supernatural activity as well, and um, so did Fodor and his colleagues. So it was, on the face of it, a really astonishing sort of evidence of, of, of the paranormal. Yeah, and the house also seems to have had an inexhaustible supply of crockery, doesn't it? <laughs> it, I mean... did, it did strike me. It was that uh, Alma's husband, Les, was a builder. They needed to have a lodger in the house to make ends meet. And yet they seemed to have an extraordinary amount of stuff, you know, ornaments, 
pots and pans and plates and glasses, every kind of wine glasses, brandy glasses, tumblers. So there was a weird something going on already to me that in this working class home there were so many objects and such a kind of gleeful or furious destruction of these objects that in itself struck me as as curious and interesting whether or not there was a paranormal force behind it. And why was it that you know have your first instinct on finding your crockery and exploding and your eggs flying across the room you used to go to the Sunday pictorial <laughs> um, does that tell us something about the times? Yes, she rang them saying she was terrified there were things going on she couldn't explain and the context for this is that Sunday Pictorial was running a series on the supernatural and had encouraged readers to write in she obviously didn't have the time to send a letter it was much too urgent <laughs> an occurrence with their stories and they received more than a thousand responses from the public. This poltergeist attack in Croydon came hot on the heels of another in Bethnal Green, which had excited the attention of the BBC and various newspapers. So poltergeists really seemed to be all over the place, and they were in the papers, and so Alma not thinking it was a matter for the police exactly. It's quite difficult to know what to do with a supernatural, alarming supernatural event. Um, she, she went to the press. And what do you think was sort of going on in terms of this like explosion of poltergeist activity? Is that a form of sort of mass hysteria? I think there, there are probably always specifics to it about individual households and individual people. But certainly the prevalence of poltergeists at that time seemed to me to bear a very close relationship to the general anxiety abroad in England then about the imminence of war. People like the Fieldings, Alma and her husband and son, the husband had served in the last war, been badly injured, still suffered from trench dreams, and the son was likely to be called up in the next. And in the meantime, that every week the papers were reporting on the aggressive manoeuvres of Hitler and Mussolini, and the country was preparing itself for war. You know, there were air raid wardens being appointed, schools commandeered, and so this um, the ghosts, especially these violent ghosts, which is what poltergeists were really rackety, um, noisy, destructive, jittery ghosts seemed to me um, a sort of oblique expression of certain kinds of anxiety that were in the air. And tell me a little about this Fodor, your sort of mis Mr. Witcher for this book. Where does he come in and what's, what's his attitude? I mean, I'm kind of interested in this line he seems to tread between scepticism and, and belief. Yes, he's a very beguiling character to me um, and the way I came across this story originally was by reading his book about his hunt for the poltergeist and the case this case sort of transformed his attitudes but already at the beginning of 1938 he was both desperate to find a ghost to, he longed to believe in in ghosts and to find evidence of them. He was very open to the idea and his job was to be a ghost hunter for this institution which um, was trying to find scientific proof of the supernatural. He was trained as a lawyer, he'd worked as a journalist, he was quite um, sceptical and suspicious in a friendly way of a lot of the claims that were made by mediums and he was gaining a bit of a reputation as a ghost buster having exposed various mediums which was not what he wanted to do but he just kept <laughs> kept fi inadvertently finding evidence of fraud when he went looking for evidence that ghosts existed and he was edging towards a, a, a sort of Freudian rather than spiritualist explanation for where these supernatural phenomena came from uh, which seemed to me very of its time and um, in the way that it melded psychical research with psychoanalytic thinking, but also very sort of suggestive and intriguing about the people um, who he studied. Well, I think the thing that's really interesting about the book is that this idea of ghost hunting and ghost busting sort of threads through so many of the themes of the time. I mean, you know, we now 
sort of see um, anything to do with the supernatural as hokum. But at the time, there seems to have been a really earnest sense that this might be undiscovered science. And the discoveries of quantum physics and so forth were, were all sort of feeding into this, this idea that there might be a scientific explanation. Is that a fair summation? Yes, there seemed to have been, a, I mean, it was always a sort of fringe activity, but nonetheless reported quite enthusiastically in, in, and with a lot of curiosity in the press that psychical research, that maybe, as Fodor said, maybe there were forces out there that we just hadn't learned to channel and harness as we once hadn't electricity. And there was a, a great deal of open-mindedness towards the possibility that people could communicate telepathically. Um, and there were the likes of so Oliver Lodge, who was one of the pioneers of radio, was a great spiritualist, having lost a son in the First World War. Um, and he certainly saw parallels between the invisible forces of the spirit world and the invisible forces of the known natural world. They referred to the um, this area as the supernormal because it wasn't seen as sort of supernatural as in unnatural. It was just natural forces that hadn't yet been understood. And a lot of scientists um, were interested in this subject. And the institute for which Fodor worked was a strange and um, interesting mixture of, uh, of spiritualists and, and scientists. And there's a peculiar side plot in which he's in the process of suing, is it sort of psychic news or so called a magazine called something like that, for accusing him of not believing enough in ghosts? Yes, poor Fodor. He was sort of caught between, so in to the eyes of some, he was sort of helplessly gullible. And in others, he was a terrible sort of materialist sceptic who was bringing all these filthy Freudian ideas to bear on, on this sort of pure spiritualist uh, material. So Psychic News didn't like him because he was exposing mediums and he was um, becoming more and more interested in the possibility that supernatural events were created by the unconscious mind rather than the spirits of the dead. And um, they accused him of being cruel to mediums and obsessed with sex and he sued them, saying this put his um, you know, professional reputation in doubt and jeopardised his career. At one point, there's a, there's a lovely bit in the, the story where I think the judge says, you know, we should remember that this is a man who travelled to the Isle of Wight to talk to Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Yes, and I think um, Fodor relished the, the comedy of some of his, um, some of the cases he worked on. So Jeff the Talking Mongoose um, was quite famous in the uh, mid-30s, much written about in the press. He was supposedly the familiar of a teenage girl on the Isle of Man whose parents also had seen Jeff and heard him, of course, because he talked. And he not only talked, he was sort of energetically insulted the family <laughs> at all times of day and night, stole from them, brought them gossip from the rest of the island, ate their chocolate and butter... And um, various islanders uh, said they too had, had seen Jeff and heard him speaking. So ghost hunters, among them Harry Price and the editor of the Listener magazine, went out in search of Jeff and Fodor eventually went and he stayed longer than anyone else. He spent a week in the, the cottage where Jeff supposedly lived. He sent Jeff a letter afterwards complaining about the fact that to, even though he brought him chocolate and other goodies Jeff had refused to appear for him he castigated Jeff and said he'd come back if he promised to talk to him next time but no Jeff left him hanging but that thing he's saying he, he found it entertaining I mean there is a sort of strand I think you say somewhere that at various points you know it almost behaves like vaudeville you know when Alma's performing because she's because she comes doesn't she just to stop as it were performing or or demonstrating her powers for various members of the Institute of Psychical Research, that it acquires a sort of vaudeville atmosphere, that they start, you know, it's, they stop being scared and start treating it as theatre. To begin with, it's all very sort of creepy and weird in Alma's house. But once she's invited to the Institute for further investigation of her powers, because it does seem, everyone agrees that the poltergeist seems to emanate from her in some way, then the poltergeist turns into a kind of genie or magician 
and Alma proves able to materialise objects from thin air as she walks around the seance room, closely observed by all the researchers at the Institute. Um, and then they become impressed in a different way by the sort of magical powers that, um, that she seems to, to have. And, um, and it is like a, a sort of, but whether it's her or the poltergeist, performing for them, bringing them gifts. And uh, there is a really intriguing mixture of the entertainment going on and scientific research. And these people who support the International Institute and attend the, sci the seances, it's an enlivening kind of curious dimension to their lives. And um, it's, it's sort of both experimentation and entertainment. There's a sort of almost weird shadow play goes on, isn't there? That at various points, Alma is in a trance and you're speaking to Alma's sort of spirit guide. Because she, she goes, doesn't she, through almost yes. every different sort of psychic manifestation from producing objects to, you know, being possessed by other beings. To... Astral projection. She, she apparently projects her body invisibly through space from Croydon to Kensington and back again. Yes. But yeah, she gets possessed by spirits, seemingly, who speak through her. And sometimes the things they say are quite convenient for, for Alma as well, in that they sort of discourage the researchers. The spirit voices discourage the researchers from pressing her too much or making too many demands of her. They're very protective of her in that sense. And you get the, um, the sense the researchers are a bit sort of uneasy, suspicious. They don't know if they're being played with or, or not. There's a curious sort of power dynamic that the power shifts between... Alma is the sort of specimen who they're investigating and their sort of prized possession, this star medium who might transform the study of psychic science and her as somebody who, who is possibly manipulating them as well as the objects that she brings into the seance room. But then there's also, the, there'll be conversations had between Alma's spirit guide and the spirit guide of one of the investigators. <laughs> There's a woman called Eileen Garrett who was one of the most famous uh, mediums of the day and at one point her spirit guide who's um, called Uvani is interrogating Alma's spirit guide who is called Bremba. I'm not sure Every, everyone's sitting around solemnly while these two spirit guides converse, one of them giving the other advice or trying to ascertain whether whether the other one is real or a product of the unconscious mind. It's a book that sort of takes a turn from, you know, a certain amount of kind of high comedy and bathos in, you know, I mean, there's flying mugs of Bovril. For some reason, you know, nothing involving Bovril can seem all that spooky, but into something that's much more sort of psychologically fraught and sort of sad. Did you sort of anticipate it going that way? Did you see the trajectory of the book as it gets more complex shaping up? Or was it as you wrote it, you suddenly you, know, you realised that there was something more here? Yes, as I wrote it, really, I was sort of drawn to the story because it had all those strands of, of something sort of serious and, and something that was sort of unsayable at the time that was being communicated through this supernatural performance or phenomena and also to the comedy and to the silliness of some of it and um, to the, the lovely sort of imaginative wild ideas that the whole episode generated. Um, but yeah, as I, as I wrote it, a more a clearer trajectory emerged that the play slipped into something darker and um, it was as if everyone got out of their depth maybe all at the same time, and that something that was, um, that was playful, curious, manipulative, and it's sort of rich and funny, became much more sort of crueler. There was a sort of element of sadomasochism that I saw emerging, and very dangerous, you know, psychologically dangerous, and, and that people started to really worry about... Um, demonic possession and psychological breakdown. Yeah, I mean, there's that sort of hint of the, which, as you say towards the end of the book, you know, plays into things like Carrie by Stephen King, for example, you know, that, that this idea that trauma expresses itself in dissociative identity disorder, which expresses itself in 
you know, stuff that looks like possession or ghostly activity. Do you think Alma believed that she was in contact with something supernatural? I don't think she knew. I, but yes, I think she believed that she might be, yes. And I don't know at which point, and I think that's for the reader. I do try to leave it open because I think that this is something, depending on what your own experiences and beliefs are, I think you'll read this story differently. So try to leave it open for the reader, but I don't doubt that she was frightened as well as, as, as Fodor would put it, mischievous. <laughs> so I think both those, those strands are there, and I think one predominates at some points and one at the other. And I think eventually her own mischief frightened her, and the fact of um, deceit and manipulation maybe sort of turned back on her. Um, so I think she was, she was genuinely scared, yeah exactly what she was scared of, how much of it was supernatural and how much of it was, was of her own psyche. Hard to know. Those things are too internal and, um, and I think that's for a reader to, to judge according to their own way of looking at the world. How, how culpable do you feel Fodor was? I mean, do you think he helped her or do you think he sort of led her somewhere more dangerous? Well, I think both. I think he did make her feel special and valuable and heard and gave her a forum and gave gave her a, a stage really in which she um, sometimes fictionally but played out sort of true things versions of herself that were otherwise unexpressed and I think that her attraction to him actually sort of led her into some dark places and I think he didn't um, really know the power that he was wielding so I think it was dangerous what he was doing. I think his intentions were good. And I think his, um, his reading of the situation was sympathetic and open-minded. But nonetheless, he was playing with fire. And I don't think either of them realised it. Yes. Do you think his, his interpretation was sort of essentially on the money? You quote extensively from Sandor Ferenczi. He seems to have been well ahead of his time as a, as a sort of authority on on the effects of trauma and yes that was that was a fascinating thing that i discovered while while researching the book that Ferenczi's work was not really known in um in britain at the time and was or in, it hadn't even been published in english but the key patient with whom he developed his ideas of trauma and dissociation and in effect shell shock because he'd worked with soldiers too in the first world war became a friend of Fodor's and passed or and took part in the in the investigation of Alma um, this woman called Elizabeth Seven and so there was this very direct human link sort of uh, before even any of these theories had been published in English between um, Ferenczi's theories about post-traumatic shock and the splintering of the personality under a tra traumatic stress and the theories that Fodor uh, through Elizabeth Seven applied to Alma. So um, that was very sort of intriguing to have those ideas applied in this apparently supernatural case. And I thought he was onto something, not just in the case of Alma, but some of the other women mediums, the female mediums, uh, psychics in his circle, that there was that, that dissociation might well, in many cases, reflect a an inability to keep the personality sort of intact after a really shattering early experience. Uh, am I right in understanding that that idea of dissociated dis identity disorder or what used to be called multiple personality disorder is still quite contested in the field of psychology? Yes, absolutely. I think it is. And I, don't, I think it's, it's still a very sort of um, questionable and... The truth of it, it's almost like the supernatural or something, how you understand the truth of it, how you interpret whether it's uh, what causes it or how much it's fictional and how much it's factual is still completely up for grabs as far as I can see. Now, you do have, which, I mean, the, the timing of it's almost sort of too good, but the historical record just chugs along in the background of this book. What were you trying to do with that, the move towards the Second World War. And, you know, I mean, there's a very memorable bit where you say, I think you quote one of Freud's disciples saying that 
Kristallnacht was essentially a sort of poltergeist incident. The psychic dissociation that, you know, they in Germany had internalized its fears and projected it onto its Jewish population and that, you know, and it's, it seems a very, very ready parallel. Yeah, I, I mean, all that just emerged from sort of reading the um, newspapers and, and histories of the time next to this case. The case came for, first, I was just looking at the case and then I kept seeing parallels with things that were going on outside. And not just with Alma, because what Fodor's theory was that um, the poltergeist was a real physical force, but it was caused by a repressed traumatic event that generated this force unconsciously. So there was that, which seemed to sort of map onto various fears and repression, repressed dread of the war that was coming or the war that was past, and then, as you say, even onto what was going on in Germany. But, yeah, you're right, sort of neatly enough, uh, straight, uh, Fodor himself was a Hungarian-Jewish emigre. He'd come to London via New York. But when he came up with these theories about traumatic repression and the supernatural and poltergeists, he so appalled his colleagues at the International Institute that they expelled him, which seemed a very neat kind of symbol for the expulsion of this sort of dark material, which was exactly what he was talking about, the way that people project outside themselves, and maybe institutions and countries too can project outside themselves representative of their, their darker feelings as a way of persuading themselves that they're rid of them. And yes, to demonise and to scapegoat and expel is exactly what his theory of, of poltergeists were, really. Yeah. Surrealism also manages to just perfectly sort of switch. <laughs> Slide well. in. Yes. In April um, 1938, Matisse's first solo exhibition opened in London, and this was one of the weeks. I mean, I try to follow quite closely for most of the book. Probably two-thirds of the book follows the four months of the investigation of Alma, so Fodor's investigation. And so I paid quite close attention to what else was going on in London at the time. And this Matisse exhibition caught my eye, and I looked at the pictures that featured in it, and they themed such kind of bizarre, dreamlike images. And I realised they drew on... Freudian ideas in much the same way that Fodor was drawing on them and in much the same way that he recognised much supernatural experience seemed to embody these bizarre juxtapositions of the banal and the exotic, of the very violent and apparently innocent domestic object. Um, and Matisse, can, sort of his, the paintings that he showed that month really encapsulated that and seemed to me that they almost illustrated the poltergeist in the home in Croydon in their spirit. And there's also, I think in the Matisse, some of the Matisse ones you describe are these sort of dissected or chopped up and objectified, a sort of blazon of a woman's body. And there is a sort of theme in here about women's bodies and their kind of constraint and the sort of odd invasiveness or almost sort of eroticized invasiveness that is involved in the investigation into Alma. The whole business of the seance in itself, you know, from the 19th century onwards, was um, seems sort of very erotic in the way that it allowed strangers to touch and feel and smell each other in these darkened rooms. And certainly the relationship between Fodor and Alma seemed to me to have a, um, a sort of an erotic edge in the way that he could touch her and um, hold her, supposedly in the interest of science, sometimes with a slightly constraining sort of cruel um, edge to it, but also sometimes more tenderly, more excitingly for her. And, um, and so all those things, I think, were at play there. All she had to make use of was her body as a means of expressing herself or impressing others. And that is uh, deployed to dramatic effect. I won't give too much away there, but, you know, she made full use. And Fodor's, like, furious curiosity about, about her body and what she's doing and the surveillance and the attentiveness, not just of him, but 
all the researchers in the Institute, is a very sort of heightened, almost melodramatic version of the relationships between men and women at that time. She parades before them, she produces things, they watch her intently and with fascination and suspicion. <laughs> no, it's an absolute stew of these ideas. Well, I, I suppose just end by asking, does any small, eensy weensy tiny part of your mind come away thinking, you know what, some of this may have been supernatural? Yes. As often as not, somebody says they have seen a ghost. I haven't. I think that also, like Fodor, I, as I wor work through this material, I thought it really isn't whether it's true or not, objectively true or not, that matters. It's what it means to the protagonists, what it symbolises, what it expresses. So, yes, maybe, and I don't think it would transform my interpretation of the story. I don't think that that is the decisive factor, whether there are real supernatural forces working through Alma or not. It's something that is obviously very interesting to work out what, what she did and didn't believe and what was really going on. But um, it's, the, it's the messages within these events that seem to me to be the most telling. Kate Summerskill, thank you very much. Listeners don't have nightmares. Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12, and you'll also receive a complimentary six months of digital access to The Telegraph for free.